Hey, welcome back. Today we're looking at Shakespeare's The Tempest. And this is one of three videos I'm doing over the play. In the first, I explore the idea of plot and conflict. In this one, I'm going to explore the tensions in power and how that ties into or explores the historical context of colonialism. It doesn't take too long to realize that all of the characters in this play really desire power or autonomy. There are several characters in this play who are subordinate or in servitude, and there are other characters who are exerting power over their peers. Several characters are struggling for and trying to take over kingdoms, whereas other characters simply want the freedom to choose to do what they want in their own lives. Our central character, of course, is Prospero. From the very first time we see him, we get the impression that he's kind of a control freak. Kind of a micromanager. You might notice that as he's telling the story of his past and his history to his daughter, he asks her over and over again whether or not she's listening. Now, I suppose she might be like falling asleep or distracted, but given her replies, it doesn't really seem true. After all, she says his tale could cure deafness. She's very interested in her past and finding out this story that she's been waiting all of her life to hear. And yet he keeps repeating over and over and over again, are you listening? Are you listening? Act 1, scene 2, line 85, I pray thee, mark me. Line 95, dost thou attend me? Line 106, thou attendst not. And line 107, I pray thee, mark me. Line 126, dost thou hear? Line 140, mark his condition and the event. Line 161, hear a little further. Why is he so insistent that she listened to him when she seems to be listening just fine? Well, it could be that he's been working up to tell this story for her entire life and he's finally putting into words this message that he's been holding on to. So maybe he's just really trying to get it right. But also it shows that he's just really very insistent and that he likes to control everyone's response to what he does. Throughout the entire play, he orchestrates all of the action, controlling every single scene, using magic, theatrics, reverse psychology to push all the characters into the position he wants them to be in. His daughter comes off as somewhat naive. He talks about her as being very clever and very well-versed, but for the most part, she seems to either repeat his own ideas or be sort of puppeted by his controlling nature. Notice in Act 4 when he finally accepts Ferdinand publicly and accepts their imminent marriage, how much he reiterates abstinence until they get married. He repeats over and over to Ferdinand, don't you touch my daughter until you all are married. And at one point when it seems like they're sitting a little too close, he kind of like, no, no, that. And then he puts on this beautiful magic show with all of these mythological figures who sing and dance to bless their wedding. But pointedly in the midst of that show, they excuse Venus and say, no, we're not going to have Venus here because we don't want any of that kind of love going on around here. So through his words, he micromanages his daughter and her relationship. Even in the middle, when she thinks she has the freedom to choose Ferdinand on her own, it's entirely Prospero pulling the strings behind the scenes. His harshness towards Ferdinand is all an act just to get the two of them to fall in love even more. And when they do, that's exactly what he wanted. And yet Prospero's power over his daughter Miranda is really just a microcosm of the whole picture of power struggles. Several of the characters are lords over kingdoms. Prospero used to rule Milan. Alonzo rules Naples. Antonio stole Milan from Prospero. Sebastian tries to steal Naples from Alonzo with a failed attempt to kill him in his sleep. Each of these characters is pursuing control and power. But throughout these power dynamics, Shakespeare also poses the issue of what makes good leadership. Prospero used to be Duke of Milan, but he didn't do a good job ruling it. He wasn't very interested in matters of state, and so he neglected his position. To the point that ultimately when Antonio stole it from him, Antonio felt he had more right to the position because he was the one actually doing the job. Later when Antonio convinces Sebastian to overthrow Alonso, he's doing that to try to free himself from the power of Naples and gain more control over Milan. Sebastian is not too quick on the uptake, but he is happy to emulate Antonio's overthrowing of Prospero. Alonso used a power play to gain more control. He was king of Naples, but he gained control of Milan by helping Antonio overthrow Prospero. None of these characters seem particularly interested in the well-being of their people. Of course, we talk very little about the actual populace of Milan or Naples. Instead, we reflect the idea of a subjugated people using the servant characters within the play. We have two primary servant characters. The first is Ariel. He is a fairy spirit, an air spirit, with lots of magical power. 
Prospero freed him from being trapped inside a pine by a witch. And so therefore Ariel owes him a debt. And Ariel is working off that debt. Ariel represents the indentured servant. Ariel and Prospero get along fairly well throughout this, although Prospero does frequently delay Ariel's release, and Ariel is eager to finally cast off his burdens. In Act 1, Scene 2, Ariel says, Isn't it time for me to finally be free? Can't, can't you release me? You promised me. And Prospero comes out on him very hard, saying, You've forgotten what I did for you. Not to mention the fact that in the middle of correcting Ariel, Prospero threatens to stick him in an even stronger tree, an oak tree. Notice when we get to Act 4, when Prospero's final decisions are really in doubt. Ariel points out that it's 6 o'clock, this is the time that we were supposed to stop today. And Prospero is not yet ready to let him go. Ultimately, at the very end, Prospero gives up his magic and lets Ariel go. Maybe. Because technically he says that Ariel has one more job to do and then he's free. And that's how the play ends. Ariel is supposed to send them safely home. But Prospero also tells the audience that he's given up his magic and that he no longer has any power. The second servant character is really a slave, and that's Caliban. He's a monster that Prospero treats with intense harshness. Although we hear in the past that Prospero and Miranda treated him kindly at first, Caliban showed them all of his secrets and showed them all of the wonders of the isle. And then they imprisoned him on a rock and beat him and made him work hard for them. Of course, there's an important detail there that first Caliban tried to rape Miranda. Therefore, he's unforgivable. And Prospero believes that Caliban cannot be dealt with in a kind way. He must be dealt with with harshness and cruelty. That's the only way to get him to understand. There are significant post-colonial ideas here, and I want to touch on those in just a moment. But throughout the play, we have to explore the problem of Prospero's leadership. We know, early on, he was not a great duke in Milan. He failed his people by being very negligent of his leadership. Now, we see him as a leader over his own daughter, we see him as a leader over Ariel, and we see him as a leader over Caliban. He's harsh and cruel to Caliban, believing that Caliban will never learn. He postpones Ariel's freedom and continues to use Ariel even to the last possible minute. And he micromanages everything with his daughter. Is he a good ruler? Will he be the good kind of leader by the end? Ultimately, it's that theme of forgiveness that comes out in the end that makes us have a little hope for Prospero. And it does seem that he's finally handed his daughter on with Ferdinand to become the future rulers of Naples. I think Shakespeare's audience would have sided with Prospero. But do we? Is it possible to still have a lot of doubt about Prospero's ability to lead? Certainly. I think you could make a complex argument either way. Finally, let's look at the way this play reflects Shakespeare's context. Shakespeare is certainly thinking about the new world as he's writing this play. There are lots of references within this play to explorers and colonizers, travelers to distant lands, bringing indigenous peoples back to England and exploiting them. Note what Trinculo says when he finds Caliban hiding under his cloak. What have we here? A man or a fish? Dead or alive? A fish. He smells like a fish. A very ancient and fish-like smell, a kind of not the newest poor John, a strange fish. Were I in England now, as once I was, and had but this fish painted, not a holiday fool there but would give a piece of silver. There would this monster make a man, any strange beast there makes a man. When they will not give a doit to relieve a lame beggar, they will lay out ten to see a dead Indian. Shortly after this, Stefano also comments, finding Caliban and Trinculo under the cloak. Believing this to be a four-legged monster, he says, If I could recover him and keep him tame, I will not take too much for him. He shall pay for him that hath him, and that soundly. Both these clowns see Caliban as an opportunity for exploitation. At the end of the play, when he first sees Caliban, Antonio also notes how he would like to exploit Caliban. When Sebastian asks, What are these things, my lord Antonio? Will money buy him? Antonio says, Very like. 
One of them is a plain fish, and no doubt marketable. Barbara Mowat, in her essay in the back of the Folger edition of The Tempest, comments on how Shakespeare used documents about the New World, and particularly the town of Jamestown particularly the shipwreck of the governor, Sir Thomas Gates, and also writings by William Strachey describing the interaction between the colonizers and the indigenous peoples. Strachey describes how the lieutenant governor well perceived that a fair and noble treatment had little effect upon a barbarous disposition. That sounds very much the way Prospero treats Caliban. And so, as with most Shakespeare plays, at first glance, Caliban seems to be more of a character type. He's that monstrous savage who just can't learn without being beaten. And yet, as is so true as Shakespeare, he undermines our feelings and understandings about Caliban. After all, Caliban is incredibly poetic in this story. And he has a remarkable ability to appreciate beauty and art. Miranda describes how she tried to teach him language, but he was too awful and brutish to get any good out of it. And Caliban replies, You taught me language, and my profit on it is I know how to curse. A red plague rid you for learning me your language. The only thing that Caliban gained by their civilizing teaching was that he learned how to use language for cursing. Did it help him to appreciate art and beauty better? No, their civilizing did nothing to improve him and his character. On the other hand, we see that he did appreciate art, beauty, and music before they even arrived. Listen to his description of the island's music in Act 3, Scene 2. Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that, if I then had waked after a long sleep, will make me sleep again. And then, in dreaming, the cloud methought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me, that when I waked I cried to dream again. He understands the beauty of art and music, which well predates their attempts to civilize him. Unfortunately for Caliban, instead of choosing his own autonomy, he shifts his servitude from Prospero to the buffoonish drunk Stefano thinking that he's finding freedom in a different master. He forgets that once he was king of his own island. Ultimately throughout this play, although Prospero seems to be the protagonist and Caliban the antagonist, we feel for Caliban at times, and we also feel uncertain about Prospero. Shakespeare loves to take our expectations, turn them on our head, and cause us to question ourselves, and question our worldviews and values. Also in the vein of colonialism and imperialism, we have Gonzalo, who's the good, loyal servant, kind and generous to Prospero in the past and now faithfully following Alonzo. He has a very significant speech in Act 2, Scene 1, in which he describes what he would do if he were the king of this island. He says, I the commonwealth I would by contraries execute all things, for no kind of traffic would I admit, no name of magistrate, letters should not be known, riches, poverty, and use of service, none, contract, succession, born, bound of land, tilth, vineyard, none, no use of metal, corn, or wine, or oil, no occupation, all men idle, all, and women too, but innocent and pure, no sovereignty, all things in common nature should produce without sweat or endeavor, Treason, felony, sword, pike, knife, gun, or need of any engine would I not have. But nature should bring forth of its own kind all poison, all abundance, to feed my innocent people. He's talking of the Golden Age Utopia, an idea that was very popular and often used to romanticize the New World. A land of plenty, where no one has to work and everyone is happy and no one does anything wrong. No need for rulers, government, wars. Compare his discussion here to, say, the land of El Dorado in Candide, or Sir Thomas More's Utopia. Thanks for watching. You can click to watch my other video over plot and conflict, or my video over magic and art. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye.